on World News Tonight. Drawing the line. China wants the US of conflict if there is no change of its policies. Reign of Terror. ISIS claims responsibilities if the leader of Pakistan blast with the population still on the edge. One month on. Turkey solemnly remembers the initial catastrophic earthquakes as the search for survivors continues. And the Battle of Flowers. Diversity, dance, music, merriment and entertainment all balled up in a parade as part of Colombia's Carnival. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening everyone and this is Abdur in a World News bringing to you updates from across the globe. Now China's new foreign minister, Shingang, warned that conflict and confrontation with the United States is inevitable if Washington does not change course delivering a stern and wide-ranging rebuke of the United States policies for his first press conference in the new role. Ching, who was until recently China's ambassador to the U.S., built up a reputation for for being a careful and accomplished diplomat while overseas. But he struck a far more combative tone in his first appearance as the foreign minister at China's annual parliamentary meeting, warning of the catastrophic consequences of what he described as a reckless gamble by Washington in how it treats its fellow superpower. Xing said an inevitable hand was pushing for the escalation of the war in Ukraine without specifying who he was referring to. The invisible hand is using the Ukraine crisis to serve certain geopolitical agendas, Xing said, while also reiterating that China's call for dialogue. China has fiercely defended its stance on Ukraine amidst Western criticism of its decision not to call Russia the aggressor in the conflict. Qing highlighted the issue of Taiwan as well as the bedrock of the political foundation of the Sino-US relations and the first red line that must not be crossed. The Chinese Communist Party claims that the self-governing democracy of Taiwan as part of its territory, despite having never controlled it and refuses to rule out the use of force to reunify it with the mainland China. Xing also urged the U.S. not to interfere in China's internal affairs and questioned Washington's different responses to the issues of Ukraine and Taiwan. Japan's new medium-lift rocket failed on its debut flight in space today after the launch's second stage engine did not ignite as planned in a blow to its efforts to cut the cost of assessing space and compete against Elon Musk's SpaceX. A live stream broadcast by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency showed the 57-meter-tall H3 rocket, Japan's first new model in three decades, lifted off without a hitch from the Tanegashima spaceport. But upon reaching space, the rocket's second stage engine failed to ignite, forcing mission officials to manually destroy the vehicle 14 minutes into the flight. Japan built the H-3 to enhance its independent access to space and bolster its changes of capturing a bigger share of the global launch market from rivals, including Elon Musk's SpaceX. It is designed to put government and commercial satellites into orbit and ferry supplies to the International Space Station. As part of Japan's deepening cooperation with the United States in space, later variants will also carry cargo to the Gateway Lunar Space Station that NASA plans to build as part of its program to return people to the moon. A successful first mission would have put the Japanese rocket into space ahead of the planned launch this year of the European Space Agency's new lower-cost Ariane vehicle. The failed launch deals a setback for the burgeoning renaissance in space exploration and industry for Japan. Islamic State claimed responsible for a suicide bombing attack in southwestern Pakistan that killed nine policemen. The suicide bomber rammed a motorcycle into a police truck in uh, Sibi, a city some 160 kilometers east of Quetta, the capital of Balochistan province. At least 10 police officers were killed and several injured in a suicide bombing attack in Pakistan's Balochistan province. Now, the attack took place on Monday local time when a suicide bomber drove a motorcycle into a police truck, which was returning from policing a cultural festival. Now, the Islamic State has claimed responsibility. The attack is the second in 24 hours to hit security forces in the province. It follows a bombing of a vehicle on Sunday, which killed one security official and wounded eight others. That attack was claimed by the separatist Baluchistan Liberation Front. The two bombings mark the latest in a series of attacks against Pakistan's security personnel. 
In late January, over 80 officers were killed in a suicide bombing that targeted police officers at a mosque in Peshawar. In Bangladesh now, the cause of the deadly fire that broke out in a Rohingya camp is yet to be discovered. Some 12,000 Rohingya refugees have been left homeless after a fire tore through a refugee camp. Now, the fire broke out at the crowded Cox's Bazaar camp on Sunday local time, destroying some 2,000 shelters, including 35 mosques and 21 learning centers. Local hospitals, water centers and testing facilities were also affected. No casualties have been reported and the cause of the blaze is being investigated. Fires are not uncommon in such camps, with the Bangladesh Defence Ministry reporting 222 fires in Rohingya camps in 2021 and 2022. Most Rohingya refugees staying in Bangladesh have escaped Myanmar after a military crackdown against the Rohingya ethnic minority. North Korea has warned of taking overwhelming actions against the latest joint military drills by South Korea and the United States. North Korea says it's closely monitoring the military activities of South Korea and the U.S. The Korean Central News Agency on Tuesday reported that the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister Kim Yo-jong said that Pyongyang is ready to take action depending on the two allies' military activities. Kim Yo-jong also warned that a military response to Pyongyang's strategic weapon tests, such as the interception of a missile, would be considered a declaration of war. She also said the North Korea's missile tests do not take place in areas under U.S. jurisdiction, nor do they harm the security of neighboring countries. This comes after the American nuclear-capable heavy bomber B-52H flew over the west coast of the Korean peninsula as it took part in a joint drill with the South Korean Air Force. According to the South Korean Defense Ministry on Monday, the American bomber and the F-15K and KF-16 jets flew in formation for the joint exercise. This is the first time in three months that the U.S. has deployed the B-52H strategic bomber to the Korean Peninsula. The objective was to showcase the robust relationship and higher caliber of the military forces of both countries, especially as North Korea continues to ratchet up its nuclear and missile threats. This air drill also comes a week ahead of the Freedom Shield, a South Korea-U.S. joint military exercise that's to be held on the largest scale in years. Following the joint drill, North Korea on Tuesday urged that international society should call for the two countries to stop their military exercises. North Korea's foreign ministry also criticized the deployment of B-52H in the joint drill, warning that this is a military provocation that may heighten the possibility of a nuclear war in the Korean Peninsula. More world news on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Iran says that it's discovered a massive deposit of lithium, a key element in batteries for devices and electric vehicles. In one of its western provinces, Iran's Ministry of Industry, Mines and Trade believes that the deposit holds 8.5 million tons of lithium, which is often called white gold for the rapidly growing electric vehicle industry. The metal's price has skyrocketed in the last year due to the high demand for electric vehicle parts, global supply chain problems, and inflation, but fell more recently undergoing a corruption amid a drop in EV sales and the slow business activity in China, the fastest growing EV market. Iran's lithium deposit news is true would be a lifeline for the country's battery economy. Weighed down by several years of heavy international sanctions and faced with a spidering currency, which hit its lowest point against the dollar in late February, Iran would benefit greatly from the ability to export such value resources, though its trading partners would likely be limited due to those sanctions. In terms of the global lithium market, such as addition to the world's known reserves would push prices for the metal down further, depending on Iran's capacity to export. Iran is also one of the world's top producers of oil and gas, but its inability to export widely due to sanctions has slashed its capacity to bring in revenue and foreign currency as well as its ability to contribute to global supply. Australian officials warned of rising risk of bushfires in the east after about two years of frequent flooding and rain as a severe heatwave pushed temperatures in several regions, including Sydney, 
to their highest in two years. A total of 33 fires are burning across New South Wales, Australia's most populous state, of which Sydney is the capital, with 12 not contained yet. Five public schools have been shut amid a total fire van across large parts of the state. Two bushfires have been downgraded from emergency warning levels overnight, but officials said they could flare up yet again. No injuries have been reported from the latest bushfires as of yet, but authorities said some residents had to be evacuated. Many regions in New South Wales on Monday recorded their hottest day since January 2021, with temperatures hitting more than 40 degrees Celsius. Temperatures are forecast to reach mid to high 30 degrees Celsius on Tuesday, but conditions are expected to ease from Thursday. The Bureau of Meteorology said hot and dry conditions along with gusty winds will elevate the fire danger levels. The state is fighting its worst bushfire conditions since the devastating fires in 2019 and 2020 in Australia's east that killed 33 people, billions of animals and burned an area nearly half the size of Germany. Since late 2020, Australia's weather has been dominated by La Nina, which brings more rain and floods, but the weather event is likely near its end and neutral conditions, which is neither La Nina or its opposite El Nino, were likely to prevail through autumn, the Weather Bureau said last week. Officials in the Philippines believe that they have located a leaking oil tanker that sank last week and has since quartered nearby shorelines in thick sludge, threatening areas of rich marine biodiversity and sparking reports of health problems amongst local residents. Authorities in the Philippines believe they've located the wreck of the oil tanker that sank off its coast last week, creating an oil spill. And like so many similar accidents before it, left local communities in fear of how much damage is going to be done to the environment and their own livelihoods before it's over. This is the province of Oriental Mindoro. From the sky, you can see the accumulating oil slick on its beaches, the dark patches in the sea and sand. The sunken ship is thought to be 1,200 feet below sea level and was carrying 211,000 gallons of oil when it went down. And it's not yet known how much oil has escaped. Florente hey, Favreau is a fisherman. The government has halted fishing operations and now he says he's afraid he won't be able to afford to feed his children. He also said pollution has given him headaches and pain in his nose. Philip Cervancia is another fisherman nearby. He says that the people are using buckets and sacks to pick up the little oil they can. It's still not clear what caused the tanker, called the MT Princess Empress, to sink. Although the Coast Guard has said it suffered engine trouble in rough seas, all 20 crew members were rescued before it went down. The local governor has promised to seek compensation for the disaster. About 89,000 acres of coral reef, mangroves, and seagrass are potentially affected. Now, one month on from the two catastrophic earthquakes that struck Turkey and Syria, with more than 850,000 children remain displaced still after being forced from their damaged or destroyed homes amid millions in dire need of aid. One month on, the dust is yet to settle on the 7.8 magnitude earthquake that shook Turkey and Syria. And the same can be said in Syria where the World Bank estimates damages at $5.1 billion. Approximately 50,000 people lost their lives in the tremor, and for those remaining, it is a humanitarian emergency. In Syria, aid was slow to reach those affected in rebel-held parts of the northwest. Tens of thousands remain missing, and hundreds of thousands lost their homes, joining the many more Syrians displaced by the 12 years of war in the country. Even before the earthquake, needs were increasing while international aid was decreasing. But we must not close our eyes or turn our backs on the Syrian people. We cannot let this be a forgotten crisis. And in Turkey, anger has mounted at a slow government response. Some described trying to uncover and pull victims free with their bare hands while they waited for rescue teams to arrive. As he prepares to fight elections in May, President Erdogan has asked forgiveness. Due to the devastating effect of the tremors, 
difficult weather conditions and damage infrastructure. We could not work as efficiently as we wanted to in Adi Yaman. I am asking your forgiveness for this. Meanwhile, more than 200 people have been detained in Turkey for upholding poor building standards, perhaps further endangering lives. France's trade unions headed for a crucial face-off against President Emmanuel Macron with fresh strikes and protests planned against a controversial pensions reform that would push back the retirement age for millions. Their goal, to bring France to a halt. Dubbed Black Tuesday, it will be a bumpy day for those taking public transport. 20 to 30 percent of flights are set to be cancelled and major disruptions are planned for metro and train services. The French transport minister advised working from home where possible. Transport workers will be joined by energy sector employees, waste collectors and lorry drivers. Less involved in previous strikes, this time drivers are planning road blockages. As for the education sector, participation rates aren't yet known, but parents are already planning ahead, considering their options if the strikes continue. Regular strike days have been held since January, but have recently lost steam. The government has refused to budge on its controversial reforms, which would change the legal retirement age from 62 to 64. Some 1.4 million people are expected to take to the streets, a figure close to the participation rates for the earliest strikes. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Iran's supreme leader has called the recent poisonings of schoolgirls in his country unforgivable, adding that they should be punished by death if deliberate. Since November, more than 1,000 girls have fallen ill, according to state media, with some politicians blaming religious groups opposed to girls' educations. UNESCO's Director General began a three-day visit to Iraq that includes Baghdad, Mosul and Erbil. Speaking from the Iraq Museum in Baghdad, opened in 2022, Azuli said it represented the historical depth of the civilization in his country. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will appoint an independent special reporter to investigate alleged Chinese interference in Canadian elections and also announce separate new probes into the suspected foreign interference. The Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency will convene in March meeting on the March 6th and 9th in Vienna, Austria, to have discussions on the strengthening and the agency's activities related to nuclear safety, science, technology and applications. Atlanta Police Department has stated that at least 23 people will face domestic terrorism charges after they were arrested amid violent protests at the site of the planned law enforcement training facility in Atlanta, dubbed Cop City, by opponents who claim it would propagate militarized policizing and harm the environment. Ukrainian forces defending Bakhmut are facing increasingly strong pressure from Russian forces as the latter are using the usual Soviet or Nazi war tactic of enrichment to easily taking over the crucial city. And that wraps up tonight's edition on World News Tonight. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And now we leave you tonight with Colombia celebrating the 120th anniversary of its traditional Battle of Flowers Parade as part of the city's carnival celebrations. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.